I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ken Coons and his crew. Ken Coons is a musician and luthier, a craftsperson who builds string instruments that have a neck and a sound box. The word luthier comes from the French word for, for lute. The term was originally used for makers of lutes, but it came to be used for makers of most bowed and plucked stringed instruments, such as violins and guitars. Ken started making instruments when he was in his teens. Many of you know Ken for his work as a longtime photojournalist for the Carroll County Times, where he started working in 1981 and retired in December 2018. Following his retirement, Ken devoted more of his time into crafting instruments. He was fascinated with instruments and folk music from around the world. He often creates instruments from drawings that are hundreds of years old. In addition to artistically crafting fine instruments, Ken is a self-taught musician who enjoys playing in his talented family band, Whirly Gig, which plays traditional Celtic and Nordic music on the instruments he creates. Members of Whirly Gig include his wife, Stephanie, son, Ryan, and son-in-law. Ken is also a highly skilled blacksmith and a woodworker. He has taught classes at McDaniel's Common Ground on the Hill on advanced woodworking, including building a dugout canoe and creating a timber frame building using only hand tools. Ken resides in Westminster, Maryland in the home he and his wife built themselves. Ken is the recipient of several Maryland, Delaware, DC Press Association and Associated Press Awards. He received the 2019 Maryland Lifelong Learner Award from the Phi Beta Kappa National Honor Society at McDaniel College. We are delighted to have Ken with us today to tell us about the many of the special instruments he has created. Members of Whirligig will then play the instruments for us. Can we have a round of applause for Ken? Thank you very much. I'd like to know how you found out all that stuff. I thought I was a pretty private person. It's like, how does he know all that? All right. Well, thank you all for coming, uh, taking time from your busy holiday schedule. What I'm going to do is uh, show you a whole lot of musical instruments, probably some or most you've never heard of. And I'm going to show you, give you a little bit of historical background about them and then also show you some construction photos, how they're made, and then my two cohorts over here, um, Ryan, who is uh, an ethnomusicologist, a graduate of UCLA. He's a PhD, and he has played many, many instruments. He's a multi-instrumentalist, -instrum and he has played them since he was very young. And Niccolo is a graduate of Peabody Conservatory, and he performs early music and many different types of music, actually. He travels all over the country, I should say the world, and he's a multi-instrumentalist also. As a matter of fact, both of them test drive every instrument that I build to make sure there, there are no uh, hitches or bugs, so they've been a great resource for me, so they're going to help me out with that. So you get to hear every instrument after we talk about it. And, and then at the end, after traveling the world in musical instruments, we're going to come back to Carol with a surprise for you. All of my instruments are essentially historical instruments, with the exception of a few. And none of them know anything or have been exposed to modern technology. So. Of course, the one thing that will go wrong in anything like this is modern technology. Ah, here we go. So I built my first instrument in 1975. I was very fortunate to be accepted into a um, U.S. government program called Youth Conservation Corps. And I spent um, 
entire summer up in the Catoctin Mountains in my 11th, just after uh, my 11th year in high school. And we spent the summer building trails and repairing things and essentially giving the government free labor. And they determined that you have a whole group of high school kids, you got to do something with them in the afternoons, in the evenings, or if you don't, there's going to be trouble. So each evening we were required to take an elective class. This was an absolutely wonderful program, and I'm sorry that it's not still around. It, it guided me in my life uh, with my desires and interests, and it also helped me um, interact and just grow. So the first elective I took was building an Appalachian dulcimer. An Appalachian dulcimer is a, a zither instrument, strings that you'll, you'll see many people play in this country, and it's strummed. And of course, I won't ever show anybody that instrument because it was awful, but it got me started. It got me started in, in over 40 years of, of building instruments. So what I'm going to start with is this fellow here. His name is um, Jan Asborgson. He is from Iceland. And this picture was taken in 1897. He was a carpenter and a stone quern maker. A stone quern is a, a stone that's carved to be round and you grind your grain with it. So those of us who are used to buying flour on the shelf, before that was the case, you had grain and you would grind each, for each thing that you needed. He is playing an Icelandic longspiel. Uh, he, he lived from 1821 to 1905. And the longspiel is probably one of the ancestors to our Appalachian dulcimer. The main difference of the longspiel is that it's played with a bow more often than it's played with just strumming it. Now this is from a publication in 1810 from George uh, Mackenzie, Sir George Mackenzie, who traveled to Iceland because he was really interested in geology and he was taken with the longspiel. And my family is, are very good friends with Bada Grimm's daughter and her husband who uh, they live in Reykjavik and they have researched this instrument and they've given us lots of information. And so they gave me the longspiel bug. So the first thing I do when I have an instrument that I want to build is I have to make a mechanical drawing. Because many instruments, I only have a picture to go by. Sometimes an old painting, a fresco, Sometimes I have an old instrument to go by, but in this case I wanted to build Sir George Mackenzie's longspiel. I learned to do mechanical drawing in junior high school at uh, what's now West Middle up on the hill, and I don't think they teach that anymore, and that's such a shame. So I'll make a mechanical drawing, and that gives me the dimensions, the size, and then I'll start carving out the instrument. This is the scroll of the instrument, the top where the pegs go to help you tune it and gives you an idea of the procedure of, of that. And each step it gets a little closer to looking like the finished scroll, which is right here. Then I have to make the other end of the instrument the, where the ends of the strings are attached. And this particular instrument is just a block of wood that's, that's carved. Uh, I use a lot of hand tools, and actually mostly hand tools in instrument building. And then the instrument is glued up. All string instruments are basically a box with strings on them. It's just the shape of the box that it differs in each instrument. Here the top is glued on, and as you can see, I have lots of clamps. <laughs> you can't be a luthier without having lots of clamps. Uh, this, this allowed me to glue the top on, and then this also, there are lots of clamps here. This helps me glue the lining, which helps reinforce that joint, and that's common, very common in musical instruments. Here's the finished long spiel before stringing and before adding the fretboard. 
And to copy McKenzie's, I had to do a rosette. The rosette is the part that goes over the sound hole, and this was first turned on a lathe and then carved to create that. So here's the finished long spiel. It's played with a bow, and Niccolo is going to show you how it sounds. Now the long spiel has metal strings. And the oldest long spiel, I think I wrote it down, goes back to, well, I don't have it here, but it's the mid 1700s. That's the oldest surviving long spiel. And of course they think the instrument goes back even further. So the next instrument that's the ancestor of our Appalachian dulcimer is the Scheitholt. Now the Scheitholt is also bowed and it's also uh, does not have metal strings, but it has gut strings. So that sound, gut of course predates metal strings, goes back a long time. And we don't know much about how the shite hole ended up in this country, but up in the Mercer Museum in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there's the shite holes that you see on the top of the photo here. And the one below that is my copy. Now, the Scheitholt, this, the original one here, was a replica that Henry Lapp in the 1870s remembered from his home life in Germany and had rebuilt here. Now, he was a Mennonite teacher uh, up in Bucks County. He taught English and German, and he played his Scheitholt for classes that he called spelling bees during the day, and at night he himself accompanied himself singing German hymns. So the original one is up in the Mercer Museum and they were kind enough to let me go up and measure it uh, with, with our friends from Iceland because this relates to the Longspiel too. The neat thing, and I find this really funny about this instrument, if you look at the sound hole there, what does that remind you of? Young people probably won't know. <laughs> Looks like a dial tone on a phone, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so now you know how the phone dial was invented. No, just, just kidding there. This is the inside of the instrument. It's essentially just a plain spruce box with gut strings on it. There we go. So now Niccolo will give you an example of the Scheitholz, which I think has become one of his favorite instruments lately. <laughs> You could easily see how that could be used to accompany hymns. So now we're going to show you an example of a modern day um, combining of Im instruments to create something new. This is a picture of Aunt Leah in 1915 in Harlan County, Kentucky, and she is playing an Appalachian dulcimer. But if you notice, she's playing it with a bow. And originally the Appalachian dulcimer was probably played with a bow as much as it was strummed. And the bowing sort of died out. Uh, a friend of ours called the sound a mosquito in heat. <laughs> and people stopped using the bow. And when it came to the revival in the 1960s when it really took off in this country, it was just strummed. People never realized it was ever played with a bow. 
But a good friend of ours down in North Carolina named Ken Bloom got really interested into the bow dulcimer, but he wasn't happy with the way it was played traditionally. So he took some ideas from European instruments, particularly the viola da gamba and the, bow, and the dulcimer, the Appalachian dulcimer bowed, and he combined them into what he calls a bow dulcimer. Now Ryan and I spent a week with him several years ago essentially learning how to build these instruments. Uh, he has built thousands of them and shipped them all over the world. So he is creating essentially a brand new instrument from, from the old. Uh, the difference between his bow dulcimer and um, the old bow dulcimer is that it's played vertically like a cello. Again, we've got a box, and here's the lining, and guess what? Lots of clamps. Uh, there's my measured drawing with the, the instrument. And I had to carve the peg head the same. In a lot of instruments that go way back in history, animal or human heads are carved. Uh, so it's a skill you have to learn, and it's quite fun. There's the finished peg head after all the carving. There's the inside of the whole box. You can see this has a sound post plate. When you get into boat instruments, they usually have sound posts which really improve the sound of the instrument. It goes from the back to the soundboard. It's just a thin piece of wood. And in the viola da gamba, there's a plate that goes across the back, and so Ken designed the instrument with this. Now, if you look carefully, the bottom of this instrument is much thicker than the top, and that is something you see in instruments from way long time ago. Bowed instruments, unless they're violin-shaped where they're carved into a shape, if they're flat-topped instruments, the rear of the instrument, the bottom where the strings are attached, are always thicker than the front, and that improves the tonal quality of the music. There's the finished peg head. Here's the inside. This has a bass bar attached to the, the top of the, underneath the soundboard. That's another thing that goes all the way through the violin family that helps improve the sound. So now Ryan and Niccolo are going to play you a duet on their respective bow dulcimers. And the beauty of this instrument is it's not tied to one culture. So they're going to play a tune called De Schlock at Light, which comes from Shetland, and it translates to the Extinguished Light. It's become a popular tune all over the world. It was written in, by Tom Anderson in 1969 when people were leaving the island to get work in other places. Uh, absolutely gorgeous tune on Bo Dulcimer.
That is a far cry from a mosquito in heat. <laughs> All right, the next one we will move on to developed in this country. And actually there are two instruments here that we're gonna demonstrate for you. This is a, a drawing, I think it was an etching and then it was eventually published in, uh, let's see, the French artist Edward Forbes made this in 1865 and it's a picture of a Union soldier playing a cigar box fiddle or holding a cigar box fiddle. Here is uh, the same thing playing it. And the cigar box fiddle was invented by people who could not afford to pay someone to make them a violin. This is before instruments were factory made. And so you collected a cigar box and you put a neck on it and you played the fiddle. And it was very common during this time to have that. The secret to this instrument, of course, is the cigar box. If you went out today and bought some cigars and you tried to make the instrument out of the box, it would sound terrible. I know this for a fact because I've tried it. The reason is because cigars t uh, boxes today are made from cardboard. And so what people who are doing this are doing is they're putting electronics to make them electric instruments. And of course, then it doesn't matter what kind of box it's in. The, the electric part of it creates the sound. But if you collect an antique cigar box, like this one, which is made entirely of spruce, good quality spruce as that, and you put the lining in on the inside, oops, there's some clamps again, and a bass bar and carve the sound holes, make some little reinforcing where the neck goes, and then you add a neck and fingerboard to it, you have a cigar box. Now, Surgeon General has recommended not building cigar boxes. They're not good for your health. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But cigar boxes weren't only just used for, uh, for violins. They were used for guitars, too. And this is a picture from 1840. And what were they playing with this music? With these instruments, what were they playing? They were playing mostly blues, country songs, any music that they played in their region, they were played with it. Again, if I used a cardboard box, it would sound horrible, but I happened to get an all mahogany box. Um, I think this is from Nicaragua, and I don't even think you can get mahogany from there anymore. So this antique box, you see the sound holes cut there. I've added a neck and some reinforcement, and I glued those two pieces together to create the instrument, added the fingerboard, and essentially created a, a sounding a cigar box sounding instrument that sounds really good. So Ryan and I will demonstrate the two of them for you right now. Now, of course, I just mentioned these were mostly played blues and other types of instruments, but we're going to play a tune from Sweden just because we like it. Thank you. That, uh, particularly if you're standing next to it, that fiddle is loud. 
So you could easily see a room full of people, or even outside, the fiddlers playing for dances. All right. Now we're going to travel over to Wales. And this is one of my favorite instruments. This is called a cruth. And the particular cruth that's pictured here is the oldest surviving cruth. It was made in 1742 by Richard Evans. And the cruth was played and made much long period before that, but this is the oldest one that's surviving today. It's in the, the Welsh Folk Museum. There are only three surviving original crews. So if you look at this, you think, well, this is a lyre type instrument, so this goes way back. But it has a fingerboard, so it's played with a bow. The instrument has metal tuning pegs, and the only way that I can make those tuning pegs is that I have refurbished a old metal lathe that was patented right after the Civil War. Uh, it doesn't have a belt that runs up in the ceiling. I put a modern motor on it, but um, it allows me to create the metal, metal pegs. So here is my copy of two of those instruments. And this is the first instrument I've showed you where the body of the instrument is carved from one piece of wood. So I start essentially with a plank that's as thick as the finished instrument will be, and I hollow it out. Starting by drilling holes and then using chisels and gouges to, to clean it out to create the sound board. This is a very old way of making instruments. It goes back hundreds of years. Now this is the fingerboard on the cruth, and what's really interesting to me about this is if you saw, the, when you saw the picture of the original, you couldn't see this design on the fingerboard, but it's there. Uh, through special modern photography, they can show where that design is actually on the finish. It's just been worn away because the instrument's been played so much. So you take the hollowed out piece of maple and you add a spruce top to it and the fingerboard. And of course you need lots of clamps to do that. And now the cruth is starting to shape up. Now, you'll see where the fingerboard goes underneath the area was hollowed out. And when I was first researching the cruth to build one, just by accident, I found out that the three surviving cruths have a hollowed out area underneath the fingerboard. Now, why would that be? And there were many learned articles on the reason for that, and none of them I felt hit the mark. I believe, and if they'd ask any luthier that builds instruments, the reason that's hollowed out is not to make change the sound or create some different reverberations in the tone. It's there to make the instrument lighter. If you could imagine holding an instrument and playing it for a dance all night, you want it to be as light as possible. So the thing that really interests me is that you have three crews from different time periods all over Wales that are saved. Every one of them, that part of the instrument is hollowed out. And they just found that out in the last 20 years. And if you make tuning pegs, you also have to forge a wrench to tune them, all of which the original cruise had. So there are the finished cruise. And now Ryan's going to give you an idea of what it sounds like. He will be playing a tune that's actually a surviving um, music from the cruise time in the 1700s. It's called the Wren. It's one of the few tunes that's left that they know were originally played on it.
Now we're going to jump from Wales over to Sweden. And we're going to introduce you to the Nickel Harpa family. And what's really interesting about this is that the Nickel Harpa has evolved. And we're going to show you three examples of how they have changed. This is a church on the island of Gotland in Sweden. And this doorway was constructed in 1350. And you can see sort of head height there around the edge, all that intricate carving. Well, all those are different figures. And there are two nickel harpa players playing that instrument in 1350 on that door. That's the oldest surviving thing that we have that says nickel harpa. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you three different styles of nickel harpa. This first one is from Italy, and this is a church fresco. And we call it the viola di cave, adding a little Italian in there. And what's really neat about this fresco is, and I thought for years, there's something wrong with the depiction of this instrument because the neck is crooked and strings don't bend like that. And then I saw a picture of the original and it's on a curved vaulted ceiling. And so that curving is from the vaulted ceiling. It is actually supposed to be straight. The viola da cave is played with gut strings only. And here's my copy of it, or facsimile of it. You're not supposed to say copy. It got me in big trouble with all the builders in Europe. Um, and if you notice that I have lots of keys on mine. Now how a nickel harpa works is you bow the string and you press a key in with your finger and that key shortens the string with a little tangent. And that is what creates the individual notes. Well, to give the musician more of things to play on this instrument, I added keys to it. Now, this instrument is also made with a solid box, sound box, that's carved out. And I quickly discovered if I wanted to make these old instruments, I couldn't just go down to the, the local store and buy wood because they don't come in those sizes. So I've uh, lear got a hold of and learned how to cut my own lumber on a sawmill. And this is a big spruce log. Uh, I have a good friend who's a tree trimmer and I go over and check out his stacks of logs. So if you ever have a tree taken down in this county, it could end up being an instrument. So here's a big slab of spruce. It's close to four inches. Well, I think this one was three inches thick when I started. And again, drilled it out, carved it out, and glued on the spruce top. Guess what? <laughs> Always using those clamps. Now, in order for you to play a nickel harper, it needs a key box, and that's one of the things that takes the longest to build. So I have to cover, cart, sorry, saw out, and then use a chisel to clear out all the notches where the keys go. And then. This particular harpa in the drawing had a very intricate wooden inlay. I used black walnut and used a chisel to create the hole and then put the pieces of wood in and then I plane it all flat so that it looks like that. And there it is with the finish on it. Here's the tailpiece uh, from the drawing, and the artist went into the great detail here because you want your tailpiece to be as light as possible. If it's real heavy, it sort of dampens the strings. And so they've removed quite a bit of wood here to make it light. So Niccolo is now going to play for you the viola de cave, and he will be doing a 13th century hymn that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary.
that fresco was painted in 1408. So that's some old, very old music for you. Here's the inside of the, of the instrument. You can see the keys and the tangents and how they affect the strings. Now we're going to go to evolution, what would be the evolution of the next nickel harpa. And this one is called a contrabass harpa. Now Niccolo's instrument had all gut strings. This is very interesting because it has a combination of one gut string and all the rest are steel strings. And they have something called sympathetic strings, which were used heavily, uh, particularly in the 1600s and so forth. A sympathetic string is a string that is not manipulated by the player of the instrument. It's strung and tuned to a certain pitch. And when you play that note on an, another string of the instrument, it vibrates and creates a natural reverb sound. Sympathetic strings are wonderful. My wife always says that everyone should have sympathetic strings. So this is a contrabass harpa, and this fellow here in the picture, um, that's Abram Norgren in 1848. And this is about the time that the contrabass uh, was really popular. So the contrabass is also created from one piece of wood with a top added, but as a, a little twist with this one, you start with a big heavy plank, of spruce. I started with a, a bowl as to start removing some of that material and eventually with chisels and gouges and scrapers you get down to where the inside has to be silky smooth and contoured so that the vibrations don't create any woofing sounds. That's the back and here's what's really different about this instrument. The top is also carved from a big thick slab of spruce. And you're removing all the wood on the inside and outside to create essentially an arch. And of course we all know through just construction, arches are really strong. So this makes an incredibly strong instrument to take a lot of string tension. There's the inside of the top. I have to make a key box again. I'm using a hand router there to flatten the key box on the inside of the, where the keys fit into. And here are all the tangents, a close up of what the tangents do. And they're pressure fitted in those holes so you can turn them right to left and that allows you to tune the instrument to just where you want it. Here it's starting to come together. And here are all the tuning pegs. All these tuning pegs have to be hand carved. And then I have a, a, a little device that's a tapered, uh, I forget what they're called, but they have like a razor blade in them and you turn it to go into that box and it creates the perfect taper for the perfect hole. So this has a lot more to it than just the, the Scheitholz <laughs> did or the Longspiel. Now this was a graduation present from Ryan when he became a PhD at UCLA and he loves ferns. So I got to have a little fun on it and create wood burnings of ferns on the instrument. These are the keys and every key in a nickel harpa is a different shape and it all has to be carved. Well, I shouldn't say it has to be because there are some people who are doing it with modern computers now, but. Um, I, every one I make is carved with a knife by hand. Here's the instrument as it's coming together with the strings on it. And this is called the face. I don't know what the Swedish term for it is, but this is something you see a lot of. There are pictures of these old instruments with this face and they look a little scary, although I think my fern carving gives it a little hair, or makes it a little softer, it gives it some bangs, you know. Here's the inside of the sound box with all the strings and, and the, the old contrabass harpers, many of them had lids to cover the strings. There are all the finished keys. Okay, Ryan's going to give you an idea of what this instrument sound like. Keep in mind it has one gut string and the rest are metal strings. 
it's got a gut string, all right. I don't know if you noticed, but did you hear the keys click when he was playing the instrument? As we've come down to the modern nickel harpa, the desire to remove that key sound has been important, even to the point where the keys are made from birch wood. And birch wood is a strong maple type wood, but it's not an acoustical wood. If you tap two pieces of birch together, they sound like a dull thud. If I tap two pieces of maple together, they sound like a sharp click. And so in order to dampen down that sound, the keys are made of birch. But with the cave, I think they wanted that sound. There is no evidence. Well, we're not even sure what was on the inside of the instrument. Now this is Eric Salstrom. Eric Salstrom uh, was a luthier and an engineer in Sweden. In 1929, he redesigned the nickel harpa from the contrabass to what is today considered the modern nickel harpa. Well, maybe not quite the modern nickel harpa because people have taken his ideas and gone further with them. But um, you'll notice with this instrument, it has a lot more keys. Boy, does that. it has three rows of keys instead of just one and allows you to play more complicated music. It also means the luthier has a lot, a lot more keys to carve. Every time I finish a nickel harpa, I don't want to build one again. <laughs> but that wears off. Women have told me that having babies is the same way. <laughs> so this is the modern keyed fiddle or nickel harpa. Now this instrument is not made from a solid piece of wood. It's made from built up pieces of wood. Not bent though, but cut out of box blocks of spruce. And you can see there I've left some extra wood on the edges so that when I clamp it together, guess what, different kinds of clamps, uh, it gives some purchase and holds the wood together. That is then carved away as well as the top and bottom, bottom are flattened. And here I'm ripping with a handsaw from the early 1800s, I'm ripping the thin spruce for the back out of a, a thicker piece of wood. There's, uh, actually I think that's going to be the back and the top. So the back is shaped. Again, it's glued in place. The top on the modern nickel harpa is also curved, but unlike the contrabass where I actually had to carve away the wood to make it curve, this is bent and we do that by steaming or boiling it in water for a little while and then I clamp them on the top of the instrument so that the it's a perfect match. There's the base bar that's glued in on the inside. And here we go, we have to make a key box, this time with three rows of keys. And to do that, we have to glue up our key box, but we also have to make it so the keys can come out for repair, so it's a little bit of geometry. I think Eric did pretty well when he figured out all this. 
Here are the keys roughed in, um, roughed in even further. Uh, use a knife. When you have keys over top of each other, the inside has to be hollow so the tangents can come up between them. So I cut that out. First I drill two ends and then cut out the center with a knife. And as you can see, there's a finished key with the other ones in progress. Now, Eric Sostrom was asked, and he passed away in the 1980s, he was asked what his two favorite tools were for making nickel harpas. One of them was an ax that he used to get the big pieces of wood out to then cut into shape. And the other was this tapered reamer tool, and that's used to hold the pegs in place. If, if your peg heads don't have the right taper and aren't an exact fit to the hole, it's very difficult to tune the instrument or it won't stay in tune. So these tapered reamers are really important. There's the instrument with, I think, the second coat of finish on it. There are all the keys. I have them on like an old gutter guard, and that keeps them up in the air so they'll dry when I put the finish on them. If I don't make sure those keys are dry and I start to assemble the instrument, they'll stick, and then they won't work. He uses modern guitar tuners in his design to tune the sympathetic strings, and this makes it really easy and quick to tune because there's 12 sympathetic strings on this instrument. That's right before we add the strings. There are the strings added. There are four playing strings and 12 sympathetic strings. There's a side view. You can see it's carved out to allow room for the bow to go. And an interesting thing developed in Sweden, I'm going to say in the early 1900s, and that's wood burning a design around the edge. And so here's the design actually from an old Swedish instrument that the person who bought this instrument wanted. So I had to create the wood burning design in the blacksmith shop to be able to, to create all the edge around it. And of course you can't pick up a cello or a violin bow and play the nickel harpa because they're long and you'll see when Ryan plays it, it would stick him right in the eye. They lost more nickel harpa players that way. No, um, you have to create a small short bow and this is made from black walnut and the curved part are thin pieces that are glued together to create that arch. There's the finished instrument. And Ryan will now give you an example of the modern nickel harpa. So that's your Nickel Harpa family. Related to the Nickel Harpa family is the Hurdy Gurdy family. Now the Hurdy Gurdy is very popular. Uh, boy, I, I know friends with players all over the world. And a Hurdy Gurdy is essentially a key box with keys just like you saw in the Nickel Harpa, but instead of playing it with a bow, you play it with a wheel. And there's so many Hurdy Gurdy builders out there, I don't build them for people until I got a request one day. This instrument that you see here is from the top illustration there is from Michael Pretorius's book that was published in 1614. Uh, it was published in German and it has descriptions and drawings of all sorts of pictures, all sorts of pictures of instruments that were popular at that time. And next to the one that you see here 
was the normal hurdy-gurdy that's taken off, the instrument of kings and prostitutes, because different times and time periods, it's been played by different classes of people. But this hurdy-gurdy in Pretorius's book, it just didn't, it didn't take off. Its sister overpowered it. And I can't find any living examples of this instrument. The only example we have that it ever existed is this drawing in Pretorius's book. So I got an email one day from a college professor who wanted to know if I could make this instrument. And I was just like, yeah, let's try. You know, this, this is a challenge. So the hurdy-gurdy is played with a crank. You, have a, you turn the crank and it's attached to a wheel. And you can see the wheel there touches the strings. It has some cotton between it to kind of make it gentle. And there's rosin impregnated on the wheel. And that's what gives a continuous bowing. So in order to make the crank, I had to blacksmith the crank and I had to create the wheel assembly. I had to go back to that metal lathe and make the flanges that go on the wheel itself. And I had to blacksmith the crank that, that holds it all together. So that's, that's what creates the sound. This is a, from the top view, and you can look down the strings and see the wheel. If you look just a plain wheel going around, it's kind of boring, but if you add different colored lights and darks wood, it creates a, a shimmering effect when the, the musician plays, and it's a lot more fun. This is a modern version of Pretorius's. It has modern frets and has a little longer keyboard, and it has a parquet top, and I probably shouldn't tell you, but the reason this has a parquet top is I was trying to bend some spruce for another instrument and it, it kept breaking. The wood kept breaking and it was really top quality spruce and I couldn't bear to have it be wasted. So I cut up all those broken pieces and these strips and combined it with some mahogany to create the parquet top. And I feel better about myself. This has a lovely piece of curly maple on the back, and I've done some inlay of ivy leaves. I tend to put an ivy leaf on, on a lot of my instruments. And inlay work is just pure fun. You essentially carve with hand tools. You carve out a slot or the shape of you want it, the piece that you want it to go in, and then you glue it into place and plane it off. All right, Niccolo is going to give you an idea of how this instrument sounds. And I bet you've never heard one before. guessing, of course we don't know because we can't find any surviving music or instruments, but we're guessing it was used for a chordal accompaniment to other musicians, which could be why it just sort of died out and never took off. Well, now we're going to jump over to Kazakhstan, and I'm not even sure how we got involved with this. Oh, I remember. Ryan was at UCLA and he called me up one day and he said, oh, dad, a professor just showed me this really neat instrument. Can you make one? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, send me the information. So this instrument is used by um, their religious leaders and they're used mostly to make, I guess, copy sounds from wildlife. They also play tunes too. It's essentially a huge spoon with a sound chamber and a skin top. And the strings are made of horsehair as well as the bow. Uh, it's again, one piece of wood that is all hollowed out. And here's a picture of me cutting off the back to make that thinner. I used a soft maple for this wood. 
So Nicola will give you an idea what the Cole Colbert sounds like. A sound for a very simple little instrument. Now this, I believe I made this instrument just last year and this was a whole new experiment for me because up till now all the instruments you've seen have been simple boxes. This is a lira di Baccio. Uh, it was made in Venice in 1563. And this instrument predates the violin and probably has a lot of things that the violin took when it was defined now into the instrument that we all know. Here is my copy of it. And this instrument was used by the courtly poet musicians in Italy to accompany themselves while reading poetry. That's probably why that no one's ever heard of it these days. How many people do that anymore? It was played by Leonardo da Vinci, who also did several drawings of it and, and really loved the instrument. And so this was a real challenge for me because this is not a flat topped and bottom instrument. This is all hand carved. And for some reason, because of the age, I decided to carve the entire instrument out of one piece of wood and then add the top to it. There's the back of mine. I added a little vine inlay. And here is the piece of curly maple after the carving process. That was one plank. And it took me about four months to, to carve that. All, all with hand tools, by the way. There's the, the uh, peg head. I tried to match the one on the original. And here is the sound top on the inside, which is also carved like a violin. This was a piece of wood that was given to me by a very close friend who passed away. He left it to me. It was a 30-year-old 30, 30 piece of spruce that had been dried, really exceptional piece of wood. I have never carved on wood that's been dried that long, and it was a joy to work with this piece of wood. This shows you a little more about the inlay work on the back. Essentially, I remove, well, first thing I do is cut out the piece that I want to go inlaid into the wood, and then I scribe around it with a knife, and then remove all the inside with chisels and knives. And it fits all together. And then I like to do a wood burning around the edge. I think that really makes it pop off the instrument. This is the instrument ready for finishing. So Niccolo will play the Lira di Baccio for you. This has all gut strings, so he'll have to tune. I didn't ask him to learn any poetry. <laughs> so rather than detract from the actual sound of the instrument, he won't have to do that. He's using a little wooden key to tune those instruments, and I found, particularly in older instruments, that they were used quite heavily. If it's too close to get your fingers in the center to tune a string, that key just makes it so much easier. You see some of the old instruments, and you wonder, how did they ever tune them? Well, this is how. They had a wooden key.
Thank you, yes. That's correct. The tuning is the hard part. Good observation. He has to tension the bow, too. As I promised, we've come back to Carroll County. Now, this is a photograph that appeared in the Historical Society calendar in 1992. It is a picture of Professor Royer's string band. Uh, I believe that picture is from 1895 here in Westminster. Now, when this first came out, I was really interested because Professor Royer is Ryan's great-great-grandfather. And he was a music professor here. He taught music. He sold pianos in a shop on Main Street. And he uh, was quite known in this community. So when I look at this, and have did for many years, I look at this picture and I say, this is in 1895. What music would they be playing in 1895? Today you'd look at it and go, well, that's an old-time string band. They'd be playing southern old-time music. Well, that hadn't gotten here by then. Bluegrass wasn't invented then. Now, in the front row, we have Grant Hildebreidel. We have Professor John Thomas Royer, Doc Hyde. In the back row, we have Hattie Hyde, Howard Engler, and Herbert Getty. Herbert Getty is Joe Getty's grandfather, former director of the Carroll County Historical Society. And Joe, in all his history-minded uh, work, has sheet music from his grandfather. And he has Grant Hildebreidel's Crescent Club March and Two-Step that was written in 1899, just a couple years after this picture was taken. So we're going to guess that Professor Royer's band performed this number. And so Joe was kind enough to send me the sheet music, and we learned it. And we're going to finish up today by giving you an example of what you would have heard at the turn of the century, 1899, in Westminster, Maryland, with the Crescent Club March and Two Step. Thanks everyone for coming, and thanks for your attention. I'm an instrument geek, so I could talk all day on this, but that's probably not everyone's cup of tea. But uh, thanks for coming out, and we'll leave you with this tune.
Thank you.